Hello everyone, Rachel here with the PATH International Education Department. I am excited to welcome you to PATH International and the third presentation in our three-part special education outreach series. We have been honored to welcome Andrea Sook as the presenter in this unique offering and she is with us again this afternoon. A little about Andrea, she obtained her bachelor's degree as a learning behavior specialist with Bradley University. She has taught in both Illinois and Arizona as a high school special education teacher, where she also quickly developed the role of preparing stu students for careers after graduation. Upon completing her master's degree in transition through the University of Kansas, she became a transition specialist in Texas. During this time, Andrea completed more than 150 transition plans for students in both high school and middle school settings. Andrea has received distinct recognition for her leadership as the ACE, Architecture, Construction, and Engineering Mentor Group for high school students, Mentor of the Year in Phoenix, the Walmart Teacher of the Year in Glendale, Arizona, and is a Target Grant Field Trip recipient. She is also a PATH International Registered Instructor. Just a little housekeeping before we begin, your line will remain muted during the presentation. Andrea will provide handouts that you can download from the handout section of your control bar. If you have any questions you would like to share with Andrea, please type your questions into the question box of your control panel at any time during the presentation. We'll answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the lecture. With that, thank you all for taking time to learn with us today, and I am so happy to be able to welcome Andrea back. Thank you so much, Rachel, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone on the line is experiencing better weather than I am here in Norman, Oklahoma. We are in the middle of this weird ice slash snowstorm at the moment. So if I suddenly disappear from the webinar, it's because we've lost power or the internet. But let's cross our fingers that it holds out for the rest of the day. As Rachel stated, the majority of my experience has really revolved around transition. This has really been my passion. So I'm so excited to share this topic with you today. Now, many of you on the line are PATH International professionals. However, I'm also going to bet we also have a few teachers on the line as well today. So what will we be discussing? We're gonna be describing and understanding what transition is, discussing how to meet the transition needs within an EAAT program, highlight advantages of creating a transition program at your facility, and emphasizing important considerations when implementing a transition program. Now, I recently returned from sunny Tampa, Florida, where I presented briefly on this topic at the Council for Exceptional Children's Conference, and teachers that participated in this presentation were so very excited to collaborate with their local EAT facilities by creating transition programs. So, this is really hoping to build the bridge between the school silo and our silo of being PATH and how do we bridge that for the benefit of all of our participants and youths with disabilities. So what are some trends? Well, we know that PATH International profess professionals have to do continuing education hours. And these include disability related topics as well as equine and discipline focused topics as well. We did talk about the 2018 CEC conference where teachers specifically sought out this presentation covering the topic of how to link to EAT facilities. And currently some PATH International member centers are directly linked with school programs or group homes currently. So quickly, I will just apologize or maybe prep everyone on the line. I wear my teacher hat and my PATH instructor hat at both times, so I will sometimes go between rider or student or participant, but I'm always looking at this person as an individual because they play many roles, but at the end of the day, they are one individual that we look at as a whole person. So what is transition? IDEA, which is the special education law, requires schools to plan for transition for all youths before the age of 16 years old. Now, some states have even required schools to start planning as young as 14 years old. And you might think, oh my goodness, 14 is a bit young to start thinking about what's going to happen after high school. 
But many high schools now have tracks of classes. A high school that I worked in previously had a nursing track, for example. And if a freshman came in who was interested in nursing, if they participated in classes their freshman, sophomore, junior year, by their senior year, they could participate in an internship. But if they didn't have all those previous classes, they wouldn't be able to participate their senior year. So lowering that age to 14 years old really helps if you're going into that mindset with high school programs to be prepared and take as many classes of your interest as possible. But going back to what are the big individualized components for transition, and I did mention it just a second ago, they have to be individualized for every student. Must be based on the strengths and preferences and interests of each student. And the transition plan must include instruction, related services like OT, PT, speech, vision, must include community experiences, hint, we're going to go into that one, and the development of skills for post-school goals. So what are some keys to transition? The big key for transition is we need to be able to know what these youths want to do after they graduate from high school. Where do they want to work for employment? Where do they want to go to school or continue training so that they can be employed at the career that they want to be at? Where might they want to live and how will they want to interact with their community? Some teachers even include recreational activity goals or continued related services goals. At the end of the day though, schools and teachers are now responsible for preparing youth for their own goals after graduation. As you can imagine, this can be quite challenging to create a transition plan. What do we do with the student who wants to be a veterinarian, but is in a tiny school district and has no related classes or experiences to be a vet? Or what do we do with the student who wants to be the next Michael Jordan, but is not even on the basketball team and refuses to participate in PE? As you can see, we do have our work cut out for us. But we have to create a plan. And the first step is to use assessments. And the assessments look at what skills a student already has. Now, the term assessments does get a bad rap in the news and the press. But transitions assessments are actually focused on skills that are needed for employment or independent living, not necessarily those paper or pencil tests on what a student can do for a math problem or how good is their writing. But transition assessments really include the performance aspect of what a student can do. We then also look at creating a class plan and what the courses a student should take to gain knowledge on that area. We look at setting goals to help the student reach their larger goal of what they wanna do after high school. We look at what services may need to be established and implemented to help them reach their goal. And finally, we determine what transition activities and experiences are needed and recommended. Now it's that last point that is really critical in the transition experiences is what we're going to dive into. So broadly defined, transition activities and experiences are not specific in the law. And this is to provide flexibility so that all students can meet their interests, strengths, preferences, and needs. Many schools are now looking towards the community for different connections to allow their students to experience work environments, practice work skills, and identify employment interests. Now I'm focused on the employment side of it, but this also includes the education and that independent living piece as well. So what is transition? Transition is really having the individual take the lead by making choices to help design their educational experience to prepare them for the future. So let's take an example for Sandy. 
Now, Sandy has some goals for what she wants to do after high school. Upon graduation, Sandy will work at a part-time job in a restaurant while attending college. So that is her employment goal. Upon graduation, Sandy will also attend a college to obtain a degree in food service management. That's her educational goal. And then finally, Sandy will live in a dorm with a roommate and join a dance club. That is her independent living goal. So all of those is what Sandy wants to do after she graduates from high school. As we can see, Sandy's looking pretty prepared. She knows what she's interested in and she has some really clear goals for her future. Now, what would the school do for transition? Well, for the first one, Sandy can be signed up for cooking classes to help her prepare for her employment goal. She can also study with her teachers to pass the food handler's card exam. And by doing that within the school environment, she will then be able to easily transition into an employment job at a restaurant for part-time work while she's going to college. Looking at the goal for her education, again, the school can easily help her reach that goal by helping her take all those courses required to graduate and which are required to enter college. She can also take a study skills course and she can volunteer in the community to build a stronger letter of intent when she does apply for college. Finally, looking at that independent living goal where she's going to live in a dorm with a roommate and join a dance club, Sandy can participate in a financial literacy class to learn how to pay bills and manage her money. She's already in a dance club at school, but can then even reach out to her dance teacher to look at dance clubs within the college environment. So this all is very easily linked with Sandy's goals for after high school, but what can be done while she's still in high school to help her build skills, knowledge, and be a really strong candidate to be employed and go on to college. So how does this relate to me? That's the million dollar question, right? Where PATH professionals are on the phone. Seems like the school's got this covered. Sandy seems great. I don't need to be on the line anymore, right? No, just kidding, my goodness. So let's take you back for a moment. Do you remember being asked what you wanted to do when you grew up? How did you answer that? When I was a kid, I really wanted to be a veterinarian. I loved animals and I would go to the vet with my mom and our dogs and I had this overall positive experience of going to the vet. Now, what if I would have asked you if you wanted to be a data modeler or a mainframe specialist or a problem wrangler support specialist? Would you be able to answer the question if you would want to be one of those professions? So most people answer, what do you want to be when you grow up with a job that they've already seen or that they know something about or maybe even tried out? I know we all know people out there that have the same jobs as their parents and their grandparents or other family members. And that's because they have knowledge on that job. But how do you answer that if you have limited experience? Did anyone on the line really feel ready to sign up to be a problem wrangler? I feel like sometimes I'm a problem wrangler during my typical life, but I don't really know what that job title really means. Or who wants to be a mainframe specialist? Do we even know what those jobs mean? And that's really where the problem lies. How can we expect kids to be able to make career choice if they don't have many experiences. Schools are now responsible for providing knowledge and experiences related to jobs. So schools must plan for transition based on student interests, but they have to provide knowledge and experiences. So your ranch can be the answer to this problem. Isn't that a beautiful ranch? I really like that. If I could have that in my backyard, I think I would have said I made it in life, but no, sadly, that is not mine. <laughs> so
So let's look at Adam, for example. After graduation, Adam really wants to work as an apprentice with a farrier. That's his goal for a career. And he wants to attend farrier school in Oklahoma to get more education and training. And his hope is to live totally independently at a location that will allow him to board a horse, his independent living goal. Now, here's where the schools start to struggle. How do they ensure that Adam is ready and is knowledgeable to be as independent as possible and as successful as possible in all of those areas? So for Adam wanting to work as an apprentice, Adam could probably take a large animal management class, but fewer and fewer high schools have that available, especially schools in rural areas. And if he wants to go on to farrier school, what classes are going to help him before he spends all of this money to attend courses to make sure, one, that he's prepared to be successful in those courses at the farrier school, but that he still has an interest in those courses. And then finally, he really wants to live alone in a place that allows him to board a future horse. So he doesn't even own horses yet. How do we know that Adam can be responsible for a horse? As you can see, what the school can do within their building and within their property is very limited. And a student like Adam is not going to be having the same experience as Sandy, who we looked at a moment ago, who has the goals to be a chef in the restaurant. So can the school even prepare Adam as they did for Sandy? Well, I'm gonna say probably not as well, unless they get creative. And this is where our EAAT locations come into play. If Adam's teacher had called you for help, could you present information to Adam and maybe even some classmates on how to use a hoof pick or demonstrate on a horse how to lift hooves? Could you have Adam come out the day the farrier is at your location so that he could watch and ask questions? Could you bring in all the different horseshoes that you have laying around and discuss the different purposes and needs for the specialty horseshoes that are out there? Could you even provide some guided practice on how to clean hooves and the importance of making sure that hooves are clean and identifying what happens when they're not clean? And how do you treat for those things? Could you even stretch further and talk about how to handle horses? We know that we have to have quiet horses to have a good day with the farrier, but how do we know how to handle a horse appropriately? And then could we even observe Adam or question Adam on his horse sense? Does he know that when a horse's ears are pinned back that something bad is going to happen to you most likely? <laughs> so at your location, do you think you could help Adam? I think you could. So now we're gonna get ready to stretch because Adam was a very easy case to connect to your location. What if Sandy's teacher had called you for help? Remember, Sandy's the one that wants to work in the restaurant and enjoys dance. And maybe due to budget cuts, they no longer have a cooking class at her school. So if Sandy's teacher called and said, I really need help for a transition experience for Sandy, could you help? And I'm going to say you could. You could have Sandy come out or you could go out to the school and you could demonstrate how to prepare dietary items for horses in your barn. And you could discuss why some horses have alfalfa and some don't. You could also do a presentation of the storage requirements of food. In many ways, they're similar to humans, but also very different. We, of course, can't have mice and things, possums in our horse food, but it's also a barn. And so we will be expected to see some of that. But how do we protect our animals? We could look at the different grazing options in your area and talk about why some horses would be in pasture and while others wouldn't. We could have instruction on equine nutritionist responsibilities. And so those first few bullets really connect to Sandy's interest in working in a restaurant 
but we've stretched it away from a restaurant job and looked at the nutritional needs of horses. Now to stretch Sandy's interest for dance, we could have her watch this beautiful freestyle final known horse dancing and see if there's any interest in that. So why should we even help Sandy though? The school's responsibility, right? Yes, they have to provide transition experiences, but if Sandy already knows she wants to work in a restaurant, why should we spend time and talk about and teach all these other things? Well, first, Sandy might have never had any experiences with horses or an equine field, and it could truly be an interest for Sandy, but she just doesn't know it yet. Many of these skills, as I had hit on a few seconds ago, are very transferable. If she's able to prepare meals for horses, could she potentially prepare meals in a hospital setting if she's not able to get a job at a restaurant? Some of those same skills are transferable. Many schools may not have the specific classes or other opportunities available to help students learn and experience the direct skills. So if the cooking classes were not available, I would even then, even though it's not listed, challenge you on this one. Perhaps Sandy's not able to pass her food handlers exam and therefore is not able to work with human food for consumption. And maybe this is because she sneezes on her hands without washing them. So humans, of course, you're not allowed to eat food prepared by a person that does that. But if we sneeze in the hay, it's probably not going to hurt the horse. So she could still find a job that overlaps her interests, even if it's not working with human food. And it could also lead to an additional recreational interest and goals for the student. So overall, again, why do we help Sandy? It's because she might have not had that experience yet to know that it's a true interest. When I think back to my childhood, I wonder if my mom hadn't sent me to horse camp, would I still have a love for horses today? I lived in the suburbs and we didn't have horses around. And so I never really got that experience in day-to-day -day life. So again, do we have this experience for Sandy so she could at least say, wow, this really is an interest that I never even knew was there. Here's a big question that is always going around in my brain. Does this translate into revenue for EAAT facilities? I suggest that it could. If you're struggling with the number of riders you have, this could be a way to help youths identify this as an interest for them. Think about how many people would go home and say, I just went to this horse ranch and we learned how to feed the horses. I really wanna start going there every day and I wanna start riding. How many parents and community members would support that? I then also think about any of your potential sponsors or donors that you have for your facility. If you have these personalized stories of youths realizing that they have this interest in horses and they're able to speak about it or write about it or show their communication through pictures, that they were able to try this out at your facility and this was their starting interest point and love for horses. And just think, all of this is through collaborations with our schools to create a meaningful transition program. So how do we meet the transition needs of youth? Thinking back to Sandy, Sandy totally scrapped all of her goals now to be in the restaurant business. She is crazy about horses. She wears her horse hat every day and she now wants to do something with horses. You have sparked that interest. As an EAAT facility, we can look at these continuum of opportunities for experiences that youths can have through transition programs established between you and the school. Here I have five different levels depicted. And each of these levels will help meet the transition needs of youth. Level one is that the PATH International Professional can either travel to the school or excuse me, can travel to the school to present general information. 
level two would be that students could take a field trip to your location to tour the facilities to interview people that you can present information on. Those seem pretty simple, right? Level three, now we start to up the ante. These students can participate in vocational exploration experiences at your location for five hours or less. Level four, we're upping the ante even more. The student would participate in a vocational assessment at your location for 90 hours or less. And then level five, the student would participate in actual vocational training for 120 hours or less at your school. Well, let's go into these more in depth. So level one, this is where you are traveling to a school to present information. You could even bring a horse or two with you or five, depending on your trailer size, right? But you talk about information on all aspects of your facility how to be a participant, how to be a volunteer, how to be an employee, what types of jobs are related to the equine field. So this is a very entry level type of presentation. You talk about a lot of different things and hope to get that interest sparked with some of the people in the audience. Now level two, this is where we have a group of students and their teachers coming out to your facility, allowing them to interview you about your role, taking a tour, maybe following you around, watching you do some of the jobs. Now this would also include people associated with your facility, maybe your vet, your farrier, or people who deliver your hay. While they're not associated with your facility on a daily basis, if you can schedule all of them to come on the same day as this field trip, you could have those same students be able to discuss questions and responsibilities for all of those roles. Now levels three, four, and five. Before we go into those much more in depth, let's take a look at different types of job experiences that could happen at your location. The list here, you will see some that are actual jobs at your location. Others are not actual jobs at your location, but that your location would house as a place to practice these job skills. So being a barn manager, whether that's paid or unpaid, each of you probably has a barn manager that is managing the facilities, the horses, their schedules. You probably have a farrier come in. You might have an equine health manager, or that might be the barn manager, depending on your facility. So those first three are actual jobs, paid or unpaid, <laughs> at your location. Now the rest of them are things that might be able to be practiced at your location, even if you don't actually employ somebody to do those things. So if we're looking at a mechanics maintenance, so if you have tractors or lawn mowers and things like that, perhaps four wheelers, could somebody go around and do oil changes, check the fluids, fill the tires? Something that again, might fall under that barn manager role, but if someone had no interest in horses or barn management and they really wanted to go into auto mechanics, they could still get a really good experience at your location to become an auto mechanic by working on mechanical items that you have at your facility. The same thing if we're a gardener. Maybe we have someone who wants to be a florist or wants to go into agriculture. You might have a piece of property that you can have a flower or vegetable garden on your property. So this way, when you have some students come to be a barn manager and practice that skill, a student, again, who has no interest in the horse aspect of it could still be on your property, but doing a totally different skill that will be employable later. The next one, again, we're stretching even farther now, but managing different items on your property. So I think about a student who might want to work in a grocery store and would have to go through each of the aisles and make sure that all of the food items are properly stocked and counted. 
those same skills happen at your location. So if they have, again, no interest in horses, could they go through and make sure that you have enough food for all of your animals and enough medications and first aid things? <coughs> Excuse me. Also looking at newsletter work. So someone who might wanna be working at a newspaper or wants to be the future web blogger, could they proofread for you a newsletter? Could they be the graphic artist on your monthly work that comes out? Or could they be the photographer for your weekly emails? And then also finally we have property maintenance. So looking at painting and tree trimming and those types of things. So as you can see, there's two different categories here. We have the jobs that are easily linked to EAAT facilities because of the inherent connection with horses. And then we have the other jobs on here that can still be done on your site because most likely they're being done by somebody, but this would give a student with disabilities practice for a job. And this is just to list a few. You can probably come up with a whole lot more. So let's look at those levels a little bit more in depth now. So that level three I talked about is the vocational exploration level. And this is for five hours or less. And I'm gonna talk about why those numbers are important in a moment. But during these five hours, a student could research, observe, and shadow you doing any of those jobs listed on that previous page or any more that you can think of. Then the next step would be, they said, wow, I really want to be a barn manager. And you go into the vocational assessment piece for 90 hours or less. And this is after that student has identified an area of interest and actually gets to participate in doing those skills. But a person with knowledge provides them specific feedback consistently and constantly. Because during this assessment period, you really want to be able to answer, can this student do the job in the future? We understand that as students, they're not going to be perfect day one, day two, or even month one. But are they showing progress? Are they showing growth? Are they learning and being responsible for different aspects of that job? That is the assessment piece. And then finally, is the vocational training piece. So after an assessment shows that the student can do the job if they were fully trained, they are now going to actually practice those skills so they can become independent at it for 120 hours or less. And basically the goal is after that 120 hours and after graduation, which is an important piece, these youth should be immediately employable in that position. So if we have a student who is interested in being a barn manager, did the 90 hours of vocational assessment and the 120 hours of vocational training, after all that time and after they graduate, they should be able to apply for a barn manager position or they should be able to reasonably go into some sort of training program to get a certificate or a degree that will allow them to then also get that same barn manager job. So let's look at a quick example. Dakota, he participated in a presentation at the EAAT facility and he really, really likes the idea of working on a ranch and being around animals. But that's as far as he got. He doesn't know what to do with this information. He doesn't know how it would lead to a job for him that makes money. So during that vocational exploration piece, the five hours or less, he could come to your facility. And while he's there, he could watch the veterinarian, the farrier, the barn manager, and the volunteer manager and he decides the barn manager position, that's what he wants. He likes the freedom, he likes being around the animals, not so much the people. He's not really interested in going to school for nine years to be a veterinarian. So he's thinking the barn manager position is best for him. <coughs> Excuse me. 
From that, he then goes into the vocational assessment piece for 90 hours or less. So while he's at your facility, he attempts to learn and try out the various skills that the barn manager does. And that barn manager or another qualified person provides direct feedback on what he's doing well and what needs to be changed or tweaked. The question is, will Dakota be able to do this job in the future? Is he showing growth? During this piece, they should not be independent doing these jobs. They might be, but they still might need a lot of assistance and constant feedback. Then we move into the vocational training piece for 120 hours or less. And this is where the team decides, okay, Dakota could really be a barn manager. manager. It is realistic. He is showing that he has some skills. He is still learning other skills. Now is the time where he spends 120 hours specifically learning and practicing those skills to be independent at being a barn manager. At the end of this, Dakota should be able to be employed in this position or again, apply for some sort of training or educational program that would lead to a degree or a certificate. Now, whoa, I'm sure there are some red flags going up there, and especially when I was saying these hours. So what about labor laws, Andrew? We can't just put kids to work at our facility and not pay them. That's going to get me in trouble. So this type of program is considered a community-based transition program. And there are labor laws out there to protect people but labor laws have also been written to protect youths with disabilities if they are learning for employment reasons. So if a student that has a physical or mental disability for whom competitive employment is not immediately attainable, a community-based transition program could be appropriate. Also, if students need ongoing support in a work setting, Again, community-based transition programs would be appropriate. So when we take into account these reasons, youths with disabilities can do the exploration assessment and training without being paid. Now there are some more caveats to a transition-based, or excuse me, community-based transition program. First, the supervision of students must be by school personnel. So by no means am I saying that the school bus shows up and drops Adam off and then leaves. Supervision by school personnel still must occur and they must be supervising the student or students. The Individualized Education Program or IEPs must also clearly define the benefit of this experience. We should be writing in there that Adam or Sally will be going to your facility and here's why they're going to your facility. And everybody on that IEP team needs to be able to sign off and understand what the benefits are. <coughs> Additionally, there should be no immediate advantage to your facility. So you cannot go out and fire your bar manager. You can't do that <laughs> because again, they are there to learn, but they are not there to displace regular employees. And as I see that little star on the corner, this is a friendly reminder to everybody on the line to look at that DCDT Fast Fact handout that is posted. Here's what it looks like, but I highly encourage all of you to print that and keep that handy. So the Council for Exceptional Children has many different branches underneath them, if you will. And one of them is the Division on Career Development and Transition, DCDT. And they've put together this wonderful fast fact sheet to go through and talk about the labor laws, those hours, and what a community-based vocational program is. So this will go more in depth into it, and you can read more about the labor laws and providing that transition experience at your facility. Now, whoa, again, we overcame the labor laws, but what about liability? Because that's also really scary. 
So first, you must feel comfortable with this activity. It is going to have people on your site doing skills and practicing tasks around potentially horses, around different types of equipment. So you have to feel comfortable with this. The first thing I would recommend is talking with the school and discussing specifics about the school trips to your location. The majority of schools will consider this community-based transition experience a field trip and students are covered under schools insurance policies. But it's always important to ask these questions ahead of time just in case something happens. Also really important, most of us as PATH professionals have these amazing permission slips and we have doctors sign it and parents sign it and riders or participants sign it. But the same would be true in this situation that in addition to that IEP being written and signed off by everybody, you also help the teacher create a permission slip so that you have more risks outlined and the benefits again that are outlined to be signed by all parties involved. Okay, so now you're on board, right? You're like, okay, we got through the labor laws, we got through the liability issues, and I'm really interested in helping Adam and Sandy. So what might this look like? Let's take a look. One of the main things we do each day is feed the horses. First, we find the horse's bridle. Each horse has their name above their bridle. Next, we find the horse and securely fasten their bridle. Then, we lead each horse through the door and into their cage. You repeat these steps with each horse. One important safety tip is that whenever somebody brings a horse in through the door, everyone else must stand behind the yellow line. Now we will talk about how we make the horse's meals. There are several different ingredients and each horse eats a specific meal. Always make sure you follow each horse's recipe as it is written. First, get a bowl and gather each item in the recipe. One. Two. Now, mix the ingredients in the bowl. Finally, take each bowl to its assigned horse. After each horse is done eating, return them to their corral. Always remember to shut and lock each gate. Okay, great. So as you can see, this group really task analyzed a responsibility of the barn manager, the feeding of the horses. And by videotaping this, they could show parents, other students, and even use it as a teaching tool for the students that are involved to really look at that responsibility of feeding horses. So at any point in time, they could have been exploring, possibly going through their assessment piece, or specifically training for the job. Could you imagine if Sally was in that video right now and she was scooping out the different amounts for horses' food? 
that would really prepare her. Now, she didn't have all of the responsibilities yet of being an equine nutritional manager, but that was just a piece of it. One of the main Oops. things. Sorry, there we go. <laughs> so hopefully now we're thinking, okay, this is doable because Sally and Adam can be employed. Yes, they do have a disability, but they do have a lot of abilities as well. They just need some more training and practice on job responsibilities and skills. So what are some benefits to your facility? First and foremost, the community-based transition programs assist youths with getting dis youth with disabilities to enter a competitively paid workforce. And that's a really important piece, competitively paid. Far too many times, a lot of these individuals are shuttled into sheltered workshops and they are paid pennies for the work that they do when really they could be competitively employed and be working for minimum wage or more. They just need this extra opportunity to one, identify what their true interest is and two, be given the time to really be taught how to do that job. And when these youths are competitively in pay as adults, this really helps everybody. It helps the community. And these then turn into workers. They're no longer students within the schools because they've graduated and now they're working for their money. And that turns into they can spend their money on their needs and their wants. And their wants would include recreational activities. So if they are a barn manager, for a place up the road from you, but they still possibly need physical therapy or occupational therapy, or they just want to continue riding, they can come back and spend money at your facility to be a participant. And then I think about if community members are aware that you have this transition program and that you're connected with schools, will they support you additionally and how will they support you? I can only tell you that in my experiences, our communities were so forthcoming with assistance and that didn't always translate into dollars. I will be honest with you, but they were always looking at how can they help? And so this will be another way to get your facility out there is doing a cutting edge thing to help people be employed in the future. I thank you so much for listening. I'm ready to take any questions that you have about transition programs at your facilities. Thank you so much, Andrea. We have a couple of flooding in, and if you have uh, any questions you'd like to share with Andrea, just type them into the question box of your control panel. So we will start with Sue, Andrea, and her question is, with transitions, are there assessments and who sets the assessment skills? So there are assessments, um, and this is a broad question, so I'll kind of answer it in a few different ways. There are pre-made assessments out there for just general transition skills, and some of them talk about, is the student able to identify their interest? And then some get more specific. Um, specifically, can they, develop independent living skills to live by themselves. And we've talked about a few of these assessments in a previous webinar, but a few examples would be the employability and independent living assessment would be one of them. For students or uh, youths with more significant support needs, there's uh, the preference indicators. And those would do just big general assessments of skills. When a youth is actually at your facility and they're going through the assessment phase, this would be something that would be more self-created between you and the school. And so this is really, again, being upfront and honest that if Adam really wants to be or Dakota really wants to be a barn manager, really understanding if you were going to advertise for a barn manager position, what skills would you want that person to have? And then basically creating your own checklist. Does Dakota do that independently or semi-independently? Do they do it without errors or do they have to be prompted to do it every time correctly? So once we get into that more role specific piece, 
it would probably need to be a self-created assessment, but there are the general big ones out there. And if you go to, I will flip to the next slide really quick for just a moment. The Zero Center for Learning Enrichment, on the left-hand side, there is a host of what's called selected presentations. And if you click on that tab, you will see a few links for free assessments for transition and it will open up a word document with three pages worth of links that you can click on and it will take you directly to all these different types of assessments and it's broken down for employment education and independent living and it also is broken down by students that have significant support needs or more severe disabilities compared to students who have less significant support needs. So I hope that answers your question, Sue. And then we have a couple questions that focus on um, costs. So Susan would like to know, how much do you charge for so many hours required for the assessment and training phases? So there, to my knowledge, really is no charge per se. It's really a collaboration between the schools and you. Um, you would be giving up time and energy um, in hopes that the community would come out and support you in various ways or that you would grow your rider base. And so that would be your contribution to it. The school would have the expense of busing and providing that personnel to oversee that student or students at your facility. Um, if you do charge, that would be something between you and the school and can always be considered. Uh, but I would hope that schools would be interested in it. But unfortunately, with budgetary concerns, that is definitely going to be a challenge. Um, as if they go to other places in the community, they probably will not be charged. And Susan would also like to know, as part two of that, uh, does the instructor, the Path International instructor, do they provide the measurable objectives and still complete progress reports? So it would depend on if that instructor was the supervisor for that assessment or that training piece. If that instructor was, I would say there would be a progress component to it. But if that instructor was not involved in overseeing that either assessment of Dakota or Adam or Sandy or that training, then they wouldn't have really a lot of insight to provide. Um, it can also be done though, because I again, don't wanna place all of the responsibility at PATH professionals, we are all busy enough, right? If you have that solid foundation and talks with the schools ahead of time and you've created the assessments, it, since that school supervisor has to be there, if the supervisor understands what needs to be done independently, they can be tracking that progress. So it shouldn't have to be this huge involved long thing for instructors or other PATH professionals it just might take that communication at the beginning so that that school supervisor understands what to look for and how to rate a person's independence at doing those skills. And Kim would like to know, have you heard of states providing grants or funding for making new transition programs? Not specifically states, but you can always reach out to vocational rehabilitation which is a portion of the state if you will they are typically the agency the state agency that we hand students off to when they graduate to assist in getting jobs and so we might have someone come to you who's already graduated and so therefore they're not being helped by the school system vr or vocational rehabilitation centers can provide that support by providing supervisors, providing transportation, paying for specific classes for that individual with disabilities. Specifically paying you could be more of a challenge. Um, there is a program out there now called Project Search, and it's a wonderful program. It's housed in almost every state 
and it is a transition program. Now school districts and sometimes vocational rehabilitation centers pay lots and lots of money to get a project search site going. So you could research what project search does and then you could at least make the argument to schools and to vocational rehabilitation centers on why you your facility would need that type of support as well. It's just a, it's a lot more of a challenge, especially with school districts having all these budget cuts. <laughs> That's great. And then uh, Sue has uh, some confusion with liability. Do the students that go for transition programs, are they only supervised by staff members uh, while there or are there other school staff there as well? So good question, Sue. If it is a community-based transition program, so these are students coming to you during the school day, then yes, they should be supervised by school staff members. Now, the key component, though, is if they are learning how to do jobs around your facility, you will need some supervision by somebody on your site as well to make sure they're doing that correctly. Does that mean two, does that mean two adults have to be following this person around at all times? No. You should always have that school supervisor being able to observe at all times that youth. And then anybody from your facility coming in and checking on a job or a skill and then removing themselves if necessary or working side by side next to the person completing tasks at the same time. So for liability reasons, um, students who come to your site will most likely be covered under the field trips insurance policy that schools hold. But this is always something to make sure to really clarify with the schools before anybody steps foot on your site. You want to make sure that you understand what those policies are and what they cover and to make sure all your permission slips are clearly lined out in that. When I was bringing students off site to a facility in our permission slip to make that facility feel better, I wrote in there, this is a school field trip and therefore students are covered under the school's insurance policy. And then we wrote down the benefits of the trip. We wrote down some of the risks of the trip and then parents, students sign and it was turned into the principal. So of course I had principal permission before putting that on a legal binding document on behalf of the school. But this way I gave copies to that facility so they could hold on to it as well. So if anything ever happened, which it didn't, but we know that it could, they had that legal binding document as well to say if anything happens, it's the school's responsibility. But again, I stress, you need to have those conversations with the school before anyone steps on your site. And Amanda has a question on location and wage. Um, in some locations, it takes the right connection to make a decent wage in the equine field. Are places looking for these transition programs for the equine field specifically? Um, well, so I will look at it kind of in a broader topic. Um, people are always looking for good employees. And there is so much evidence out there to support youths with disabilities and adults with disabilities when they are employed at livable wages and it is with an area of their interest they make excellent employees who are responsible and loyal to those businesses so we have to start getting the word out there that if someone regardless of ability or disability is loyal and is willing to do whatever job of interest they have, which for some of these students might be mucking stalls, or it might be really doing all that feeding and movement of horses from different pastures. So if we can get the word out there that if you take this chance and you hire this employee, most likely, as our research has shown, they're going to be loyal to you. They're going to be hard workers. And we have given you a knowledgeable, skilled employee because they've gone through this transition program. 
And the transition program, again, is pretty broad. We have to kind of stretch our thinking because even though they might be coming to your facility to practice skills as a barn manager, they might end up working in a pet shop, which doesn't deal with horses, but has some of that same care and responsibilities for animals. So again, it's kind of this balance of what is the benefit to the field for therapeutic activities? What is the benefit to the rider? What is, or excuse me, the participant or the person with disabilities? And then what is the benefit to the community at large? Did I hopefully answer your question, Amanda? I hope. <laughs> And then our last question is from Jack. He wants to know if this can work on a very small operation with just a couple of horses. Absolutely, Jack. This can definitely work in a very small setting. And we just look at really targeting who's going to come out to your setting and when. So we might only target having one individual from the school come out who really wants to work as a farrier. Maybe that's the only person who comes to your site. Or maybe we have someone come to your site every day, but they're doing different things. We have someone coming out to look at the mechanics and someone coming out to do the farrier and someone coming out to do gardening. So it's as big or as small as you would like it to be. Because again, this is all voluntary on your behalf. No one is forcing you into this. Um, and it does take a little bit of time. So it's what are you up for? I would always suggest to start small, have a couple of success cases so you can understand here's how this is working with the school. I want to try it out before I fully commit to having so many more people come out here. Um, so those are just some good recommendations, Jack. I would say you can make it as big or as small as you want, and it doesn't matter on how big or small your herd is. All right, that's all the questions we have. Andrea, I wanted to thank you again for joining us on the conclusion of this three-part series, and we hope that everyone gains some valuable resources to make further connections with schools, students, and teachers in your community. Well, great. Thank you so much. My contact information is on the screen. You're, everyone is always welcome to reach out to me with any questions or concerns. Well, thank you, everyone. We hope to have you join us for the next educational opportunity in the future. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks.